This video is going to be talking about irritable bowel syndrome, also abbreviated to IBS. This disease deals largely with the digestive tract and nervous system. Some things you should know. IBS affects 9-23% to of the global population and as much as 20% of the North American population suffers from this disease. Due to its difficult detectability and similarities in the symptoms, IBS patients are commonly misdiagnosed as having inflammatory bowel disorders such as Crohn's disease or bacterial infections. Simultaneously, IBS used to be considered a neurological disorder because no physical dysfunctions could be detected. Patients would simply be told to stop complaining. The disease was all in their heads. Today, IBS is considered legitimate, and the medical field actively seeks to improve the lives of those suffering from the disease. Those most likely to suffer from the disease include women, people under the age of 50, people who have been subject to sexual or physical abuse, people who suffer from depression or anxiety, and those who have had a prior bacterial infection of the intestinal tract. In order to understand how IBS affects patients suffering from the disease, there are a few things you need to understand. As was mentioned before, IBS is characterized by dysfunctions of the digestive and nervous system. A normal function of the digestive system is known as peristalsis. Organs in the digestive tract are lined with smooth muscles that are signaled to contract in order to move food along. Peristalsis is involuntary. It is a function of the autonomic nervous system, the ANS, the division of the nervous system that functions on a subconscious level. Peristalsis is initiated by signals sent from the brain, which is where the nervous system comes in. The autonomic nervous system is in direct contact with the central nervous system, the CNS, the division that makes up the spinal cord in the brain. The ANS and CNS are constantly relaying information back and forth between your gut and your brain to regulate functions. Signals such as sights, smells, and the sounds of food or the presence of substances in different portions of your digestive system initiate peristalsis. Additionally, internal and external stimuli stimulating a stress response will also be relayed to the digestive tract. Under normal circumstances, peristalsis is regular, rhythmic, and anticipated and maintains a voluntary aspect, especially if the time to defecate is inappropriate. The final division of the nervous system that you need to know about is the enteric nervous system, or the ENS. This system is a neural network that exists entirely in the gut and transmits information between digestive organs. It functions similarly to reflexive responses in that it doesn't need to communicate with the brain to initiate motor functions. The messages between the autonomic and central nervous system, as well as the messages relayed between the neurons of the enteric nervous system, rely on the neurotransmitter serotonin. It is one of about 30 known neurotransmitters in the human body and 95% of it resides in the gut. So what happens to the regulation of these functions when someone has IVF? First, biopsies on the tissues of those with IBS don't reveal abnormalities. IBS is characterized, rather, by a combination of symptoms experienced by the patient. Through examination of the symptoms, medical professionals have attempted to provide explanations for the presence of symptoms. The most prevalent symptom across the board is abdominal pain. This pain is usually chronic rather than acute and is usually localized to the left abdominal region. One explanation is that somewhere along the lines, information between the gut and the brain gets misinterpreted as pain rather than as a normal function even when the gut is functioning normally. Other explanations suggest exaggerated muscle contractions or spasms of the muscles resulting in abdominal pain. Another explanation has to do with serotonin levels in IBS patients although concrete conclusions are yet to be reached. Reasons that serotonin levels are thought to be involved include an observed increased or decreased level of serotonin in patients' digestive systems, regulation of symptoms with the treatment of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, medications that affect serotonin levels, and a link between chronic stress, anxiety, and depression and serotonin levels, as well as a link between these mental conditions and the presence of IBS. Other symptoms of IBS include bloating, flatulence, sudden urgencies to defecate, and an inability to control defecation or bowel incontinence. When a patient goes to the doctor's office, there are a few things that the doctor will do to test the patient for IBS. First, the doctor will perform a historical examination, including familial and personal. Studies on twins and observations on families have shown that IBS might be a genetically transmitted disease. A twin is twice as likely to have the disease if his or her twin has been diagnosed with it, and individuals are three times as likely to be diagnosed if an immediate family member has the disease, especially if it is a parent. A doctor will also check for a history of bacterial infections of the digestive tract. 
It is common for IBS to follow a bacterial infection such as gastroenteritis or a bacterial overgrowth. This is presumably due to permanent damage caused by the bacterial infection to the neurons of the ENS. Along with a historical examination, a doctor will conduct a psychological investigation to check for signs of acute or chronic stress. A number of IBS cases indicate that those suffering from IBS have experienced acute stress in their lifetime, such as an incident of sexual or physical abuse, or are currently suffering from chronic stress, depression, or anxiety. Along with this trend, serotonin levels appear to be lower in individuals suffering from chronic stress, depression, or anxiety, indicating a lower level of serotonin in the digestive system, causing diarrhea or constipation. So a doctor will evaluate the current social and mental state of the patient, along with his or her overall emotional well-being, to see if that is causing them to be susceptible to the disease. It is widely believed that rather than one cause, a combination of triggering events or predispositions can increase the likelihood that someone will develop IVF and is sometimes necessary for the disease to arise. A physical examination follows a historical examination and includes an abdominal examination in which the doctor will check the abdomen for symmetry, normal peristalsis, tenderness or pain in any organs, as well as rectal tears, reflexes, and hemorrhoids. Additionally, more invasive examinations can be performed if they are necessary to rule out other diseases. Tests range from stool tests that check for disease or infection to sigmoidoscopies in which doctors observe the large intestine through a tube equipped with a camera and a light that is inserted through the rectum. After a complete examination, patients who display symptoms of IBS will be subtyped into one of four different groups. IBS-C, which is characterized by at least 25% constipation resulting from anticipated bowel movements. IBS-D, which is characterized by at least 25% diarrheal bowel movements. IBS-M, which is a combination of 25% diarrhea and 25% constipation. And IBS-unsubtyped, where there is not enough abnormality to classify the patient. Additionally, the Bristol stool scale can be used to differentiate stool type, ranging on a scale from 1 to 7 one indicating stool that is hard and lumpy, and seven indicating stool that is watery with no solid pieces. Finally, patients who meet the criteria on the Rome 3 scale are likely to have the disease. The Rome 3 criteria include a display of symptoms for at least three months and two or more of the following displayed for at least three days of each month. Improvement with defecation, change in frequency of stool, change in form of stool, abnormal stool frequency, form, or passage, passage of mucus, bloating, or abdominal pain. Treatment for the disease is handled in a complementary approach. It seeks to reduce symptoms and to improve the patient's overall quality of life. There is no cure, so a patient's best course of action is to develop a relationship with a physician to help them find a treatment plan that works best for them. Current treatment options include natural products. This includes peppermint oil and antispasmodic with few side effects, probiotics, which support the health of the intestine with no known side effects, and aloe vera, which increases stool frequency, also with no known side effects. Diet-based therapy, increasing or decreasing dietary fiber, this can be effective for some, detrimental to others, while sometimes showing no effects. Conventional medications, laxatives, which relieve immediate symptoms but damage the intestines in long-term use. Antibiotics, which may improve overall symptoms but can have adverse side effects and SSRIs have been shown to decrease pain in some, but contain many side effects. Mind-body practices such as hypnotherapy, exercise, and physician-to-patient education have also shown improvement with no known side effects. IBS is a long-term condition, and it will come and go throughout a patient's life. The good news is that it usually doesn't develop into anything worse and is not considered to be a precursor for cancer.